It's good to have everyone here today. Uh, we are continuing in our series, According to, some of you were gone last week, maybe you were on spring break, we hope you had a great time. Last week we talked about Easter according to Moses. If you missed that, you can get caught up very easily at citychurchwest.com slash watch. Uh, we talked last week about Easter, Easter eggs. That's not going to mean anything to you if you weren't here, um, but it was important to us, so I'd love for you guys to get caught up. What we're doing in this series is we're looking at Easter from multiple different angles. We're trying to understand the full context of what it was and why it's so important to our life. Last week, we talked about Easter eggs. Today, we're going to talk about triggers. Uh, triggers are stimulus all around you that subconsciously, subconsciously, move you to action. There has been incredible research over the last couple of decades about our subconscious minds and how really the parts of our mind that we're not even aware of are responsible for the majority of our actions throughout our lives. What we talk about, who we vote for, the purchases we make, where we find ourselves, how we make friends. A lot of this starts in our subconscious and they've studied what they call Triggers and triggers are things throughout our lives that s stimulate our subconscious mind and move us to action. Uh, so I've read some fascinating books. Probably the best was a book called Contagious by a guy named Jonah Berger, and it was the best because it made this idea of triggers and your subconscious mind very user-friendly. He gave some great examples. One of them was a grocery store, and over a period of time, they ran an experiment where one day they would play French music over the intercom, and the next day they would play German music, and they just kept going, French music, German music, French music, German music. And then they just watched what happened. They kept track of everything that they were selling, and it only took about a week for there to, to be a very clear pattern that on the days that French music was playing, the sell of French wine skyrocketed. When German music was playing, the sell of German wines skyrocketed. And this was all happening at a subconscious level. When you're in HEB, how many of you are really paying attention to the music that's going on in the room? One guy. <laughs> There's got to be some... When I'm in HEB, I'm thinking several things. I'm thinking, why am I in HEB? There's curbside pickup. People will bring it to my door. I don't want to be here. There's too many people. I'm thinking, why does no one know how to drive a buggy? You drive your car on the right side. You drive your buggy on the right side. Can I get an amen? No, no. Not all of y'all follow that rule. That's impossible. I've seen you at HEB. I'm not paying attention to the music. You know what's crazy? And sometimes I'll be laying in bed at night, humming along to a song that I don't even like, going, how did this get it? I think this was on the intercom at HEB. Subconsciously, things can sneak into our mind and they move us to action. Another great example, uh, the study of these triggers that trigger us to action at a subconscious level. The, the study has really come a long way and so now these giant corporations are using them to trick us into buying their products. So uh, Kit Kat bars, the, the delicious, amazing, can this message sponsored by Kit Kat bars. The, <laughs> Kit Kat bars from 1986 to 2007 had the same advertising, the same jingle. Break me off a piece of that. Kit Kat bar. All of the, all the teenagers are like, what? What just happened? <laughs> in 2007, they had plateaued. Uh, financially, they were bringing in about $300 million a, a year. That's too many Kit Kat bars. We got to calm down a little bit. $300 million a year in Kit Kat bars, and they had plateaued. Um, and so they went down a new path and all of this study of triggers had come up, so they, they decided to trigger Kit Kats off of coffee. And so all of their advertisement was Kit Kat and coffee. Coffee and Kit Kat is a, a commercial of someone buying a coffee, and then they would grab a Kit Kat on their way. And it was so brilliant. It's, it's, it's a beautiful trigger because billions of people drink coffee like religiously every day. And because of this simple trigger, Kit Kat and coffee, their sales that year went from 300 to $500 million, a $200 million difference. Triggers are incredibly powerful. This is what the author of Contagious, Jonah Berger, this is one of his quotes. He said, rather than just going for a catchy message, consider the context. Say that with me, consider the context. Think about whether the message will be triggered by the everyday environments, the daily flow, the daily rhythm of people's life. Triggers are very powerful. And, and I see triggers 
all over scripture. Here's the thing about all this science. We're learning all these things about triggers. We're, we're discovering them. But the reality is science is just us gradually understanding the things that God put into motion in the first place. If anyone can trigger and use our subconscious mind for our own good, it is the God who created our minds. And so God understands these triggers, and we're going to talk about maybe the most effective and powerful one. Today, we're going to talk about Easter according to communion. Now, communion goes by a lot of names, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, it's done in many different ways. Some people do, you know, the shot glass thing, and some people dip and drink, and people do it in all kinds of different ways, and it's because there's different denominations, there's different religious backgrounds, there's different traditions, but what I really care about is considering the context, looking at what Jesus was really trying to get across that first communion, because at City West, we have said we are going to radically pursue Jesus's original intention for our lives as well as for his movement that he started that we're all desperately wanting to be a part of. And so we're going to consider the context of communion. We're gonna look in Luke's gospel, his historical account of Jesus's life, Luke chapter 22, and we're starting in verse seven. It says, then the day of unleavened bread came, and when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, and Jesus sent Peter and John, some of his disciples, saying, go and make preparation for us to eat Communion, is that what it says? No, the Passover. Jesus didn't say go make preparations for us to eat the Lord's Supper. I guess he would have said my supper. I don't really know how that would work. He said go make preparations for Passover. You see, it, one of the most dangerous things that religion does is, is it takes a part of scripture, it takes the text without the context. And anytime you have text without context, you have what's called pretext, which means that your assumptions, your realities are projected onto the meaning of the text. And so what you can do is you can take a text to scripture, void it of its original context, project your own context and your own ideas and your own traditions, and you can now use that text of scripture to control, manipulate, and hurt people. Context is critical. If we want to know Jesus' original intention for us, then we have to understand it through how he has revealed it to us, which is in the Bible. But the Bible is text, and to truly understand the meaning, we can't just have text, we have to have context. Text without context is pretext. It's why text messaging can be so dangerous. It's why text messaging can cause so many fights, because you get the text, but you don't get the context. And so you take a very normal text message like, hey, comma, what's up, question mark. And based on who you are and what you've been through and who they are and what they've done to you and what you believe about them and what you believe about yourself, you could read that a lot of different ways. You could just take it at face value like, hey, what's up, what's, what's going on, what are you doing? Or maybe you think this person has a problem with you, so you read it like, hey, what's up? <laughs> you, wanna, you wanna do something? Or maybe you kind of regret giving your number to this guy, and so you're reading it like, hey, what's up? <laughs> what's up, girl? When Katie gets a, hey, what's up from me, she knows what's up. I'm <laughs> the text alone it, it, it is inefficient if you don't understand it in the broader context. And Jesus didn't say go and prepare for the Lord's Supper. He said go and prepare for Passover. So if we wanna really understand what took place at this first communion, this first Lord's Supper, we have to understand what this Passover is and what the significance is in Jesus' life and in Jesus' time. And so we're way over here in the New Testament reading about Jesus' life, and we're gonna go almost to the beginning of the book, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 12, to read about the first Passover. Here's what it said. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's families, one animal per family. You must have an unblemished, some translations say spotless animal, a year old male that you may take from either the sheep or the goats. You must have a male spotless lamb. 
They may, must take some of the blood of this lamb and put it on the doorpost and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. They are to eat the meat of the lamb that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This was the first Passover meal. Last week we talked about Moses. If you weren't here, maybe you're familiar with the story. The Israelites, the Jewish people, had lived in 400 years of Egyptian slavery. They were in bondage. They were doing backbreaking work. They were treated like animals. It was terrible. 400 years and God sends Moses. And right here at the first Passover meal, the Israelites were preparing. This is This is pretty wild. They were preparing for the angel of death to come that night. The angel of death. Can you imagine being the angels and you're getting like assigned your positions? Like you're going to be the angel of rainbows. And every time it rains, you're going to just, whoo, yes, rainbows, love her. You're going to be. And then it's like you get to be the angel of death. What? I don't want to be the angel of death. The angel of death plays a very important role. So the angel of death is coming. They're getting ready. God has been motivating the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, to release the Israelites. And he's been doing it through a series of nine plagues. These plagues have come upon it, devastated people. People have died. All of their crops are gone. All of their animals have died. Their water turned to blood. All of these crazy things. But Pharaoh was so stubborn and hard-hearted that he would not budge. He would not let the people go. And so God let them know, the angel of death is coming tonight. And he is going to kill the firstborn son of every single family in the land. But if you follow these instructions, if you kill the male spotless lamb and you paint the blood on your doorpost, then when the angel sees that blood on the door, it will pass over your house. And Israel heeded the warning and they followed the instructions. And the Egyptians failed to heed the warning of a God that they did not believe in. And it says there was a great cry the next day as the Egyptians woke up to find all of their firstborn sons had perished. This secured Israel's freedom. It moved Pharaoh to relent and to release them. And in verse 17, the Lord told the people, you are to observe the festival of unleavened bread because on this very day, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You must observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent statute. This was an incredible day and it was seen as probably the most important moment in the Jewish people's history, the day that God miraculously delivered them from 400 years of slavery. And they, they took this to heart. God said, you are to observe this on the same day, year after year. And every year they would gather and they would eat a Passover meal. And over time, it became this tradition where everyone had their place and they would start reclined at the table and they would sing some hymns maybe or sometimes quote some scripture. And then the pinnacle of the celebration was when the host or the head of the party would stand up and they would tell the story again of how God miraculously saved them from slavery and how the host would tell the story is very interesting. They would take different elements from the meal and describe the significance that it had to Moses and to the Israelites as they escaped. That is the context of Passover. Jesus was on earth about 1,500 years after that first Passover meal and in that time, it had actually become a tradition of pilgrimage. So. Jewish people from all over the known world would all travel to Jerusalem and that's where they would observe the Lord's Supper. And so if we go back to Luke 22, the verses we already read, the day of unleavened bread came when Passover lambs had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John ahead. Millions of people would converge on Jerusalem. You had to find somewhere to host your meal. And so Jesus sent Peter and John and they eventually found an upper room for them to partake. And so then they they came back. They had secured the location and Jesus and his disciples started heading into town. But here's the deal. Jesus wasn't just going for the celebration. He was going for a coronation. Jesus was showing up to Jerusalem to establish himself as the king of all kings, and the people could feel it. 
He showed up and people had lined the path and they were going crazy. Picture the river walk after a Spurs championship. People were on fire down there. They were ripping branches out of trees and putting them on the path. They were taking their own robes off and putting them on the path. They didn't even want the donkey Jesus was riding on to have to walk on the dirt. They were singing his praises. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh man, it was amazing. It was a king entering his kingdom. Everyone could feel it. But Jesus knew that this wasn't gonna end the way everyone thought it was gonna end. This would be a coronation like no other. Instead of being dressed in the fine linens of a king, he would be stripped naked and humiliated. Instead of wearing the crown of his ancestors, he would have a crown of thorns pierce his skull. Instead of sitting on the throne of a king, he would be hung on a cross to die with an inscription sarcastically saying, here is the king of the Jews. All of this weighed very heavy on Jesus' heart and on his mind. He knew that his disciples really had no context to understand all of this. And so they started the Passover meal. In verse 14, it says, when the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles were with him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This wasn't the first time Jesus had talked to his disciples about suffering. On their entire journey to Jerusalem, he kept reminding them, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. I will be be put to death. And then three days later, he prophesied about his own resurrection. But Jesus says, I have fervently desired. He has this sense of urgency. I, I wanted to have this Passover with you because Jesus knows that he's within hours of going through the crucifixion. And I imagine that it was very hard for the disciples to believe this. If they didn't say it out loud, they had to at least be thinking like, okay, Jesus, I, I think we're good. I don't know. I mean, did you see the entrance? that they get? People are all about you, man. There's, no, there's nothing to worry about. In fact, we even know in scripture that the disciples had begun to argue amongst themselves of who would hold what position in Jesus' palace. They knew that this was going to end in Jesus' glory, and that meant their glory as well. These were young Jewish men, but even though they were young, uh, they probably had spent every year of their life at a Passover meal. It was just tradition. They probably grew up with their fathers or grandfathers as the host of the meal who would get up and take the elements and tell the story of the Passover and the escape from Egypt. Maybe some men in their community who were upstanding and influential would lead their Passover celebrations and they would be the ones. But now they had the opportunity of a lifetime to sit at a Passover meal with Jesus, the greatest teacher to ever walk the earth and listen to him retell the story of Moses and the bondage and the slavery and and the Passover and the escape. And finally, the time came and Jesus stood up to tell the Passover story. In verse 19, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks so far. So good, he's on script. He broke it, he, he gave it to them. It all felt very familiar to every Passover that they'd ever sat at. But then Jesus flipped the script and said, this is my body. This bread that for 1,500 years has stood as a tradition ordained by God that has represented for generations and centuries us getting up and leaving out of Egypt, all of it, this is my body body, which is given and broken for you. And when you eat it, you do it, not to remember Moses, but to remember me. And the disciples were like, Did, has Jesus been to Passover before? Does he, he's off script, man, I don't. 
Jesus was making a statement. He was saying that in all of the history of all of time, that in all of God's revelation to the world, that what started with, with Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha, what happened with King David and Solomon and the lineage and, and his ancestry, all of it was being fulfilled right there in front of him. What the prophets have spoke of for thousands of years is now standing in the supper room, breaking the bread, saying, this now is about me. He doubled down on it. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This isn't about the blood of the lambs and the goats. This is about the blood of the perfect lamb of God poured out for you. I thought all week long of an illustration shocking enough to try and convey what it would have been like to be a Jewish man sitting at that Passover meal. Jesus hijacking it and saying, this is about me now. I thought all week and I got nothing. This would have felt a lot like heresy. This would have felt a lot like blasphemy and sacrilege. Unless he was right. Over the next 24 hours, these same disciples watched that same Jesus arrested and brutally tortured and eventually hung on a cross to die. And the amazing thing is that in Jesus' visit to our flawed and broken world, the, the cross was not a detour, it was the destination. Jesus was telling his disciples that All of history and all of eternity hinges on what he was getting ready to do that very night. You see, what he knew is that even though we may not be in actual slavery like the Israelites were in Egypt, maybe we're not owned by another person, but we are all born in slavery to sin, every single one of us. And when you are a slave, you go where your master goes. And one day, at the fulfillment of time, all of sin will be destroyed and decimated in the fiery pit of hell. And we need help. We're like the Israelites, unable to win our own freedom. But now it's different. It's not the continual sacrifice over and over of the male spotless lambs. Now Jesus came, just like John the Baptist said, when he saw him, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is no longer us spreading the blood of the lambs on our doorposts. It was the blood of Jesus spread on the posts of the cross for the first time the lamb sacrificed itself, the solution and the source. And by one moment of belief, we can have freedom. We no longer have to live in bondage to our sin. We no longer have to live as slaves. We have been freed and all we have to do is believe. That night at the first Lord's Supper, Jesus was talking to disciples who already believed. He wasn't talking to them about overcoming the penalty of sin, which is separation from God. They already had that. You get rid of the penalty of sin when you believe, but we still have to live our life in this flawed and broken world, and there is still the power of sin. And how amazing is it that sons and daughters of light can continue to live as if we're in the darkness? God has given us the free will and the free choice to do that. You overcome the penalty of sin by believing one time in one moment, but you overcome the power of sin by remembering every single day. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. When you eat it, when you drink it, you do it to remember me. You know, oftentimes we wonder how the first season of the movement of Jesus was so powerful. How did these apostles and these disciples have so much power? It's because every day they remembered. You know what's amazing about what Jesus did in in this communion is he created a trigger. The bread that they broke that night was a part of almost every meal 
the Israelites would ever eat. It was the cheapest bread you could afford. It was unleavened, which means you didn't even have to pay for the yeast inside of it to make it rise. These disciples would eat this bread every day, the wine that they drank. This wasn't a $400 top shelf bottle. This was watered down, bad table wine. But they drank it every day because the water often wasn't safe to drink by itself. Jesus, he said, when you do this, you remember me. When you drink this, you remember me. And it wouldn't be a month until the next communion event that they would stop to remember Jesus. It was the very next day and the day after that and the day after that. Every day they remembered the cross and the danger of 2018 is we have taken a trigger to remember the cross and we've downgraded it into a tradition. We have taken what was supposed to be a lifestyle and we've made it an event and it has to be ornate and it's gotta be in a sacred place and it's gotta be blessed by the sacred man and it's always a man. That's not how it works. It's about people. It's about every day of your life finding a way to remember the cross. We're so busy and we have so much information coming in. And a lot of times we get confused and in and, and this, this movie that we think our life is, we think we're the star character, we feel so important and we can go months and quarters and years without thinking about the cross. Some of us never really pause to consider what Jesus did except Easter to Easter to Easter. And if we wanna be a powerful, vital part of the movement of Jesus, it starts with planting ourselves firmly at the feet of the cross. We have to find a way to get triggered, to remember. You wanna defeat the power of sin, you have to remember what Jesus has done for us. And so we thought a lot about that. And we're gonna do something different in communion today. And, and I don't know that everyone's gonna like it. It may be a little bit shocking, but I promise it will not be as shocking as Jesus taking the Passover meal and saying, nope, this is about me now. It won't be as shocking as his disciples that same day watching him hang on a tree. I started thinking about what would be a good trigger for us to help us remember. I thought about my own life. What was something that was in like the everyday flow of my life? I started thinking about our context today. We understand it in its original context. It was meant to be a reminder every single day. What is something that we would have a hard time going more than a few days without having in front of us? And so today, we're gonna take a 2018 San Antonio communion of chips and salsa. And And let me just, let me talk to the people who aren't clapping um, and sincerely say that I do understand when you start jacking with people's traditions, uh, it can get testy. And so I'm asking for an umbrella of grace because my prayer all week and there have been people awake since five o'clock this morning praying that if even one person in this service, if only one person the next time they have chips in front of them thinks about Jesus. There's one person who starts thinking about the cross every single day, who starts realizing that our best life isn't through our own power and our own initiative, it's through the power of the cross. If there's one person who can remember, that person will change things. That person will be used by God in unimaginable ways. And so here's what I want you to do. I I want you when you come up to get your chip, I want you to get an image of what Jesus has done for you in your mind. Maybe you've seen the passion of the Christ and something like that can be recalled. Maybe you've seen a a painting or a picture or maybe you just have your imagination from reading about Jesus being whipped and being nailed to a cross and suffering and dying. Get it in your mind what Jesus has really done and I want all of us to pray. I want you to pray it out loud before you eat that chip. A four word prayer. Help me to remember. God, 
Help me to remember. If we can keep the cross in front of us every single day, then we will be equipped to defeat all the evil that comes at us in this world. How can you go on believing that you are unlovable if every single day you're faced with the reality that the God of the universe came down to this earth just to die for you? How can you continue to give up in the midst of your suffering when it was the suffering of Jesus that made the pathway for your salvation? How can you continue to try to escape your pain through drugs and sex and alcohol and pornography and gossip and overworking when you know that Jesus at any moment could have escaped that cross with all the power of heaven but he hung on it for you how can we lose hope when we know on the other side of the cross was an empty grave In all these different sections, we have communion set up. I want to ask you guys after I pray to come down. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you are realizing for the first time today that you are living your life in slavery. You are chained down You are in bondage to your sins. And all it takes to find freedom is one look of faith, a moment of belief, realizing your need for a savior, believing that Jesus is who he says he is and that he's done what he says that he's done. And that will break every chain. I heard a great quote we're gonna talk about on Easter. I'm gonna let it out of the bag though, uh, Pastor. It, 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 it highlights and magnifies our need to stay close to the cross. He says, we do not fight for victory, we fight from victory. Some of you are spending your entire lives trying to fight battles that Jesus has already won on your behalf and all you have to do is look. Some of you have been believers for a long time, but you're allowing the power of sin a foothold in your life. You go to church, you read your Bible, you do the studies, you help people, you give a little, but you're not remembering. Every day, remember the cross. Remember what Jesus did. Remember where your freedom came from. We're not content just to meet together crack open the word, feel good about ourselves for the rest of the day. We are here to be a movement that affects real change in our city, real change in our country, real change in this world. But not through our power, through the power of Jesus that was released to us and made available through his death and his resurrection. Easter, according to communion, is that Easter isn't an event, it's a lifestyle. It will transform you, it will empower you, and you will see things begin to change in your life and in the world around you. Would you guys pray with me? God, we love you. I ask for anyone in this room who is realizing their need for a savior. And oh, what a savior you you are. So wonderful, God. Beyond words, beyond description, what you've done for us. God, if there's anyone in here, I pray that they would, right in this moment, choose to believe. God, you've given us the ability to choose this world and to choose you. Just a moment of belief. I pray for the rest of us, God, that we would choose to remember. We would find that trigger. We would stay near the cross. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.